Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good morning. My name is Claire, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'm grateful to be sober and a proud member of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'd like to thank Suzanne and Charlie and the committee for the wonderful hospitality that you've shown us. And and I'd like to thank Tony for being the perfect hostess. And I'd like to thank you for your warm welcome and the high energy of love I felt in this conference this weekend. It's only by the grace of God and this program that I stand here sober this morning. And as I look at your smiling faces, I always feel the same feeling as if I am standing in the sunlight of the Spirit. And little did I know when I sat in my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous that my life indeed was going to be rocketed into a fourth dimension of living. I'd like to bring you greetings from my home group, the Robertson Originals, and um, they're meeting this morning, and that's where I usually am on Sunday mornings when I'm in Los Angeles. Uh, It's been a long road to stand here. By the time I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was living in the south central section of Los Angeles in the ghetto sick of living and scared to die. With two young children, an eight-year-old daughter and a nine-and-a-half-year-old son. I had come to that place and it wasn't where I wanted to be. But by that time, I was absolutely doing a dance of death. And I had become a Wynette. In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which is the basic text of our program, in chapter three, more about alcoholism, it it explains the the, um, the insane things we continue to do to keep from doing step one and two. And in there, it explains that we switch to natural wines. I had not switched to a natural wine, man. I had switched to Ripple. That's not one of your natural wines. Um, As a matter of fact, I don't think grapes have ever been near it. (laughs) I think they just put some chemicals in a bottle and shook it up real hard, put it on the local liquor store shelves, and aged it for about three hours. (laughs) And I managed to be standing in front of some clerk, feeling that feeling of pitiful and comprehensible demoralization. I would come to sometimes at that awful hour in the morning, three or four o'clock in the morning, sometimes spread eagle in the, in the grass in the front yard of that little ghetto house where I was living like an animal, of food stamps and welfare. And I would come to and I would hear the quiet of the world around me. And all I could hear was my heart beating in my ears. And I would feel the dampness of the dew. And I would wake up and stand up and come out of those black house and look around me. You know, looking good it was, it almost killed me out there. <laughs> and I could remember getting the dew off my shoulders and straightening up my red wig. <laughs> look around, see who's looking. <laughs> I assure you, there was nobody in the ghetto at that hour in the morning peeking around the corner to see how I looked. <laughs> But there was a lady who lived across the street. I could always depend on her being there. God forbid she should think I'm drunk. But I look across and I see her little curtains moving back and forth. And I quick get her a finger. (laughs) Stumble up the steps. Open the door. Lean on that door, and I could smell that aroma of terrible feelings of a, the home of an alcoholic and that wine, the stench of the wine. 
and I could feel it coming, rush down the hall, get to the bathroom, get on my knees in front of the toilet bowl, do a few chin-ups on the rim of the toilet bowl, <laughs> can be sliding around the rim trying to find a safe place to stand. <laughs> Reminds me of this story. I was in this church, and the minister said to the congregation, does anybody in here know where God is? And this little nine-year-old boy raised his hand and said, I know, preacher. And the preacher looked at him and said, how do you know? He says, well, every night my daddy comes home drunk. Comes up the steps, goes to the living room, goes down the hall, goes into the bathroom, gets on his knees in front of the toilet bowl, and I can hear him in there saying, oh, God. And that's where you find me at 6 o'clock in the morning. And then I would have that feeling that when I, my eyes open, I needed a drink. And the wonderful little Dr. Silkworth who gave you this fellowship, the first step that describes the problem when he says, we are powerless over alcohol, and the second half of the first step says, and our lives are unmanageable. And I needed a drink more than I needed anything else in my life at that moment. And it was always, you know, my alcoholism had brought me to the fact that alcohol had become my higher power. It was my lover, my confidant, and my best friend. And somewhere along the line, it had changed on me, and I was determined to make it work for me again. And as, as I kept drinking, I kept getting into that sense of doing the dance of death while I tried to make it work. And then the wonderful doctor said, I would have to have a drink and the phenomenon of craving would start. And I'd come off that flow out of a fetal position and start to get dressed to make my run. 65 pounds overweight, pull on my tight jeans, put on a bad leather jacket, straighten up that red wig, <laughs> put on some star fire earrings and hung them my shoulders. And my mode of transportation by that time was a pair of gold fuzzy house slippers. <laughs> Turn up the car and the pain would start. But I'd have to pass that door where those two kids of mine slept. And there's something about ghetto houses at that hour in the morning. There's a temperature change. They creak and they sound as if they're rolling. The sound of those sleeping kids would always break my heart. And I would tiptoe past the door because I didn't want those kids to wake up to see Mama having to make the run again. When I had promised yesterday I wasn't going to do that today. But I would cry silently, get past the door, open that door, tiptoe down the stairs in the darkness of the morning, feeling like a thief in the night because I had to get down to that liquor store and sometimes I'd be flirt there. Stand outside, watch the dawn come up. Not one of my fair weather friends that Bill Wilson talks about in his chapter ever showed up outside of that liquor store when I would watch it through my dog glasses, you know, and feel the feelings I always felt at that hour, that loneliness standing outside, that the world was a hostile place. I had never known how to live in that world. Not one ever showed up and said, how are you this morning? What are you going to do with your life today? When are we going to lunch? I had bought all the love that I could afford. And there was no more money to spend to buy. And I stood there lonely. And finally this liquor store clerk would come and we'd walk in and I'd go in behind him. And, you know, I had long since given up cute. I would have tried to play those little games of life that I was used to playing. And I would follow him in and stand at that town and feel that shame. I guess feeling like Bill Wilson when he talked about stealing the money from, from his wife's purse. And how many times would I have to run my hand in my pocket and all I had was the 59 cents I usually take for my kids. Their grandparents and my family would give them money. And I needed it more than they did. But I would feel the shame and I'd make the promises and I could never keep those promises and I'd wait till we get the change put away. And we started, you know, do that little thing that clerks do it in the ghetto at that hour in the morning. They ask dumb questions. 
lean on the counter and look at me and say, now, Doc, what are you going to have this morning? Now, it depended on what my morning was like that morning. And if it was a bad morning, I'd look at him and close one eye and say, man, let's not play games. I don't have time for games this morning. Just put that wine in the bag and let me go. And my biggest choices in my life at that time was uh, whether I should get the red ripple or the white ripple. And he'd shove it in the bag, and I'd get out of his sight and get past that plate glass window, lean on the building. I had long since given up um, beautiful drinking. See, I had given up oh, the bottle openers and the proper cocktail napkins and the proper stir and the crystal glasses and the smiling faces of handsome men and mood music. It was all gone, and all I had to do was unscrew the top off that wine, take a hit off my wine, and ease the pain. And uh, one more time, say, I don't need it. I'm not going to drink anymore today. Shuffle back to that house and sit in an overstuffed chair with a terracotta robe on. Watch people run out of those ghetto houses and go wherever they go. I was no longer employable, and I had drank away all the wonderful things that the outside pleasures of life were gone. And then I hear those two kids come out of that room, go in the kitchen and talk quietly to each other. and make their breakfast and make their lunch. And I'd say, tomorrow. I'm going to get out of the chair tomorrow. I just can't do it today. And they'd go past me and go down those steps, and I could remember their little heads going past the window. And I'd sit there and I'd reminisce about the good old days. I'd come from the fast lane. I absolutely played that game of life where, life where I knew how to walk the walk and talk the talk. And little did I know at 27 years before, when I had that first drink in Boston, that it was going to take me to that place in that ghetto. And all of the wonderful things and wonderful people in my life were gone. So I would just uh, sit there and reminisce. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was born in a, what was considered then an affluent black family. I'd been given all the best of... Uh, chances to, to be somebody. My parents were not alcoholics. My father was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian who was born on a reservation in North Carolina. And I am the youngest of seven children, and I'm the alcoholic in that family. And I, was, I believe I'm one of the ones that was born restless, irritable, and discontented out of the chute. I am one of the ones that could use a little drinky poo in the first grade. I mean, just to get me to the second grade. Because I had problems. I had problems with authority. I had problems with that with the Union Baptist Church where I grew up in that family. And they were a wonderful family as I understand it today. And my parents are not uh, uh, the reason that I'm an alcoholic. So I, I, w I would just uh, hang around that, that, that family and that school, and I hated all of it. And I grew up in Georgia when segregation was, uh, was very, very strict, and I, I never liked rules. And in that school, I didn't do well, and I isolated a lot, and I stayed away from people because I was afraid of them. I don't know what it was, and my life was always motivated by fear. I've done many inventories, and I sponsor a lot of women, and I do a once a year for the last seven years, I do a workshop for the women I sponsor in my home, and I continue to do those inventories, and it doesn't matter what the fear was then. I won an art scholarship for my high school to go to Boston, to the Boston Museum School of Fine Arts. And that's where I ended up, and I remember sitting on that segregated train out of, out of Atlanta and giving Atlanta the finger. And I swore I'd never go back to that place. And when I got to Boston, it never occurred to me. I took me with me. <laughs> same fear, the same feelings of low self-worth and low self-esteem and, and the fact that I always felt inadequate as a human being. And somehow the messages had been set down from God on how you live, and I had no idea what that was about. 
I had another secret because my life was always filled with secrets and always filled with fantasies. And I'd always uh, hung out in the movies and, and to escape having to deal with people on any level. And I would sit there in that office and it was my first addiction. And I loved jazz music and one of my secrets was to be a performer. I don't know how I ever got into that when I can't sing and I can't dance. But I, uh, but I would listen to this jazz music over and over again, these records. And one night I was walking down the street with another student. And I heard this great jazz music come out of this door, and I, and I said to this friend, I said, why don't we go in there and see what they do? I had never seen alcohol in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says that more will be revealed. But at, to that point, I had not seen any alcohol, and I had never, never recalled seeing a person intoxicated. But I walked in there, and I can still remember the aroma of the cigarettes, and it was dark, and that food smell, and... And this lady was down there singing this get down music and I walked up to that bar and sat on a stool with my friend and the bartender leaned over with a Pepsi dent smile. <laughs> and said, Well you gonna have a drink? And I had no idea. And my friend had never had a drink, had no idea. But I remembered in the movies they always talked about martinis. <laughs> And I was about to commit my first hip slick cool act. <laughs> I leaned on that bar and looked him straight in the eye and I said, we'll have a martini, honey. And make it dry. <laughs> I had no idea what I was ordering. <laughs> Guy turns around, he puts these two stem glasses up on there and he poured it out, evened it out. I looked at the stem glass and it looked like lemonade. Well, I didn't know you sip drinks. <laughs> so I picked it up, I drank it in one go. I was a pig from the gates. <laughs> so while I was sitting there, I remember the feeling. It went down warm and it spread out. And I began to look around me, I saw another world. Dr. Silkworth says that men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. And he nailed me because I love the feeling. And I wanted to feel that way for the rest of my life. And as I was sitting there waiting to um, die, because I had grown up in that Baptist church, and I think this place I was in was a den of iniquity. And I'm holding on to the bar, shaking around and jumping around, and I got quiet, and I started to hear the music. Stepped off that bar stool and uh, looked around the city of Boston, started to gather some colorful friends. The book, big book calls them loyal companions. <laughs> And I loved it. I just loved it. And I walked out in those streets and I began to learn how to walk the walk and talk the talk, hang in those jazz clubs on a nightly basis. I became a star kissing entourage junkie. Hanging with the big names because I figured that uh, their greatness would rub off me, on me by osmosis. And I have learned that nothing rubs off on you on, by osmosis, not even the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's the steps to, uh, to work until we can live them in our God consciousness, and they're the traditions that we honor. Because it, it, it is those traditions that, that keep our program together, and the steps are uh, to the individual, what the steps are to me today. So I got out in those streets, I married a nice young man, and I got married, and, and we had the same kind of background. He, he, he didn't come from a family that drank. And we became drinking buddies. And for 27 years, we would stay in that marriage that was absolutely the sickest relationship that two people could have ever had together. Uh, we had no sense of responsibility for ourselves. And all we wanted to do was stay out in those clubs and, and, and play the game of life. We had a little son, and that was part of, of, of the guilt that I began to feel because I had no idea what to do with that child. I had never known from inside of me what the word love meant because I had no feelings of emotion and I could never identify it. 
But one of the things that I can say to you, because I can tell you the truth, it's because of you in meetings like this and rooms like this, you know, you have taught me that it is the truth that will set me free. And I can tell you that I was afraid of that child and I didn't really want to be bothered with him. And his grandparents took him to raise him and they passed on and they did a wonderful job. But the pain would start when I would have to, out of guilt, go over and visit that child. And it's something about a little child growing up when they get to be three and four years old and they look at you with that look. And I would look at him and he would look back at me and I could see the feeling of disappointment in his eyes. When he'd say, but you promised me you would take me to the park. I said, I know. I know, baby. But next, next time. And he would look away from me, and the tears would come, and he'd walk away. And, and every time I share that, I still feel, you know, that feeling of pain in my life that I couldn't understand why I felt the way I felt, and I had to get out of his sight, get back in that car, and get back downtown, and climb up on the nearest bar stool with the, the rest of the geniuses of the world. We would continue to solve the problems of the world. And they, it, that went on for a long, a long time. My ex-husband traveled, uh, late ex-husband traveled a lot of, in, in those year, early years of our marriage. And uh, I kept looking for Mr. Wonderful while I hung out in those uh, clubs in Boston, New York, and Harlem. That was my circuit. And if you hang around jazz bars long enough, Mr. Wonderful will show up. And one morning in an after-hour place, I'm sitting on this stool next to the late, great legend and my friend, the late, great Billy Holiday. And we were having a drink together. And Mr. Wonderful showed up at the end of the bar real quiet. Black hat turned down all the way around with a blue top coat over his shoulders. And this dude was so cool, he couldn't get his arms through the sleeves. <laughs> And he smiled at me and reached in his pocket, pulled out a big wad of money. I just love money. <laughs> and he peeled off 10 $100 bills and put it down on the bar. He spread it like a deck of cards. He leaned in one eye closed and he said to me, spend it. <laughs> then I knew that God had answered my prayer. Mr. Wonderful turned out to be the head of the mafia, and I was already in step two. <laughs> and Mr. Wonderful had a limousine, one of those old uh, Mercedes with the wide white wall ties. And he'd send that lim limousine to me with two bodyguards, all the hardware on the floor and the horses with all the guns. And I would sneak out of that apartment we lived in, when I put painted moles on my face and my wigs, and I had an array of wigs because I would always show up on those bar stools uh, and, and ask, who do you want me to be tonight? Because I never knew who that person was under the wig. Trying to live out the fantasies of, of uh, people pleasing because people pleasing was an art form for me. And he'd send that car, and I would just sneak out of there with painted moles on my face and black sequined dresses and, and a long cigarette holder, which was wonderful, except I don't smoke. Um, and I'd climb into that back seat, and they'd pull those two little seats down, and, uh, and we'd be off for the evening to play some more games of life. And it seems to me that the God that I'd come to believe in from time to time would try to get my attention. I would come to crossroads in my life, and I invariably always took the road that was self-destructive. I don't know what it was. It always had that feeling that I had a death wish, because I never knew how to feel as if I was, I fit anywhere. Uh, I, today, you know, I, 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 I look back on that, and I, I remember getting kicked out of that school, and I would sit there on those boxes stools, and I would blame all of them and talk about it only. 
And one Sunday morning, I was being driven home in that in that limousine, and we were all hung over, the Mr. Wonderful and the bodyguards, and everybody's head was going back and forth. And we and we passed a corner where this young families were standing. It seems that God would try to get my attention. In Alcoholics Anonymous, we call it a moment of clarity. And as I looked out that rear window and saw young families taking their children, wherever you take young children on a Sunday morning, I soon to church, wherever they were going to enhance their spiritual growth, and I knew nothing about that. I had never taken my son to a park. And by that time, he was 10 years old, and I had stopped going to see him because I couldn't stand the pain in his eyes anymore. But I made a decision as I looked out that window, and I said, I know what my problem is. My problem is Boston. If I just get out of Boston... Get away from these hoodlums and the hookers and the madams and the pimps who were my friends. And move to California. And we, we made, I always made decisions with a glass in my hand. We picked up that kid and put him in the back seat of that car and he felt like a stranger riding along with us as we went to California. I didn't know how to behave around him. I didn't know how to, to talk to him. I, I didn't know how to reach out and touch him. But I never was able to do that to anybody without a glass in my hand. I was able to act out all of those feelings as long as I was drinking, but when I was sober, I felt restless, irritable, and discontented. We moved into a, a little place uh, outside of L.A. in the beginning, and then we moved closer, and I had made the promise that I was going to be a better mother and a better wife. But I have a disease, and it's called alcoholism, and what I, I do what I do best. And when I found the nearest bar that was going to be my favorite watering place, I crawled up on the stool and the, let the fantasies begin again. We had two more children. The grandparents moved out, and my family all moved out to the West Coast. And my alcoholism, I believe, affected the lives of every single person that loved me. And by that time, I was beginning to get completely out of control, and I, I couldn't get drunk, and I couldn't stop drinking, but I kept kind of hanging there and looked good and pulling off. We went into a small business that became successful. It was a house cleaning business, and maintenance business, and property management. And the more we made, uh, in the material sense, the more I drank. I had never known how to deal with success at any level. I thought that was just another means of buying more love. And by that time, uh, that old, that youngest, that son of mine was about 18 years old. And I began to lose it all. I never thought I'd stand in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and say, thank you, God. Thank you that you took away from me everything I wanted in order to give to me what I needed. At that time, I needed to get sober. I needed to find a God of my understanding, and I needed to accept the, the ch second chance at life. And one day when I was standing outside of that house, the oldest son is 10 years older than the two younger ones. And everybody had had to walk away from me. I remember those loving sisters and brothers of mine who would come and look at me, and, they, and I could remember the look in their eyes, too. And it was that look that I, it's described in, in, the, in the vision for you as a, as a hideous four horse. The look I would always see was terror, bewilderment, frustration, and despair. And they'd look at me one sister, she said, we really love you. We don't understand why you live the way you do. We've done all we can, and we don't know what else to do for you. And my attitude was, you don't understand. Because I had no idea I was an alcoholic. 
I knew what my problem was. It was people, places, and things. They just get off my back. And as I stood outside the house with the son who was now 18 years old, and the family had walked away and they knew nothing about Al-Anon. I had never heard of Alcoholics Anonymous until my first meeting. And that was 17 and a half years ago on April the 9th, 1974. And as I stood outside the house while the marshal put the lock on the door, and, and the internal, internal revenue took the rest of it, the older son stood there with tears in his eyes. The look was different. It was a look of a young man who, who couldn't cry over a drunken mother. And the look was a look of love and hate. And I had no place else to go but to the ghetto. And he looked at me and he said, I'm not going to the ghetto with you. We don't even know who you are. You have never been there for us. And I say, yeah, I know. Have another drink because that's how I resolved all my problems and my feelings. It was have another drink and think about it. And by the time I got to that ghetto and sat in that overstuffed chair, there's nothing sadder than an alcoholic sitting in an overstuffed chair drinking and thinking. Or what went wrong. Those sisters, I had one sister who uh, tried to borrow some money from her to save that house. And she said, no more, no more. It pains us. And I'm not going to enable you anymore. I'm not signing any more checks and bail you out of any more trouble. And I am grateful to God that God was working in their lives, that they stopped enabling me to continue to do the dance of death. Because there's no way I would be standing here this morning. I know I'd be one of the ones that would be dead from this disease. But they had the courage to walk away. But that older sister of mine, who is now 87 years old, looked at me and said, but I tell you what we will do for you, darling. We will pray for you. And I have come to believe in the power of prayer. Because I believe it was their prayer as I crawled around on that floor in that ghetto uh, dying physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Sometimes with strangers and sometimes alone. It was their prayers that I had that moment of truth on that morning. But I got over there with my little bag and those two kids and I started being in horrendous blackouts by that time. I'm a real alcoholic the kind of on page 21 of the big book because I drank for years without the blackouts and the years without the losing the control but I was totally out of control by that time and by the time I got in there and I, I just couldn't function anymore I believe I drew the drapes and was doomed to die of this disease and I got settled in there and I would go off to the local little wine bars and I was now not drinking in the best jazz clubs in New York City and Boston, but I was drinking in, in, in beer joints with sawdust on the floor. And I'd get beaten up in those places, and I would go and I'd sit and I, you know, I'd go wear the dark glass and try to heal the wounds and, and try to figure out what went wrong, because you see, I would try to go back to the same places and, and the results was always the same. It never understand. It never occurred to me that pain has no memory. So there I was, and I'd end up in those hospitals. And one um, Sunday morning, one more time, God getting my attention in an area called Inglewood, California. Lying in that bed with people working over you desperately to save your life because that's what they're dedicated to doing. And I'm lying there and I don't want my life saved. I would invite all the violence in those clubs and in those streets, hoping that they would kill me because I didn't have the courage to do it myself, only to learn that committing suicide is a final solution to temporary problems. And so I would... Uh, you end up in those hospitals, and there I was that morning. Police at the foot of the bed, thank you, God, that my parents didn't get to see that. 
they left me, but they still loved me. And I didn't have to inflict any more pain into their lives. There was an older nun, and I, you know, I come from a Baptist background. And I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. These two, these two nuns were leaning over me. There was an older nun uh, in the late 60s and a young nun about 23 years old. And I had known in my heart today that God speaks to us through others. And there I was in that bed with uh, a brain concussion. Because out of that blackout had become a lot of damage. A brain concussion and I was bleeding out of both my eyes. The older nun wasn't thrilled with me at all. I was giving her a lot of lip, and that was always my defense, to keep people away from me, and they wouldn't know how afraid I was. And I remember the older nun turned, and she stormed out of that room. But the young nun stood there, eyes as blue as the heavens. And the beauty of this beautiful young woman leaning over me, and the tears began to fall, and she was looking at my face, and she started to suck up the blood out of the corner of my eyes. And my face looked like a trampoline, and they'd been using it to jump up and down. I remember in that blackout, they kicked out my ribs one at a time. And as I lay there, the young nun started to cry. And as her tears fell on the covering of the bed, she looked at me, and she didn't ask me the questions they always ask me, like, why don't you stop drinking, and where is your willpower? She said, how did you let, ever let your life get into such state? And I looked at that young nun, and I, I, I don't know. Surely not alcohol. I don't know. And I turned away, but I didn't forget the question. And I'm sure it was that young nun that God had chosen to bring the subtle message. Something was wrong with my life. And so I just stood there, and I sat up in that bed and looked around me. And three days later, they had put two-inch wide adhesive tape around my ribs, and they kept me for three days because of the brain concussion. That same young nun helped me get dressed, gave me back my red wig, uh, my bad leather jacket, my dog glasses, and my tight jeans and a pair of boots. And a paper bag filled with my worldly belongings. She escorted me to the front of that hospital, and she stood with me and put her arms around me with the passion, uh, compassion of another hu loving human being, of which I knew none of those feelings. She looked at me straight in the eye, and she said, "Try not to drink today." And I'm an alcoholic. I looked across the street, man, and there was a liquor store. And the phenomenon of crazy started. Trucked across the street, bought myself to want some wine, went back to that ghetto, and it was about three weeks later while I was healing again from the outside pain. I came to that morning in a field position, too tired, make the run. Thank you, God. And I believe what happened to me that morning was a divine intervention of a power greater than myself that kissed me gently and said, child, get off the floor. You don't ever have to live like this again. And little did I know it was uh, my moment of truth. When I read the story of Bill W., when he questions his, questioned his sanity about his spiritual experience, and he called the wonderful little Dr. Silkworth, and he told him about this experience. And Dr. Silkworth said, I don't know what's happening to you, but hang on to it. It's better than what you had before. And I remember reading further away, Bill's thought about this, and he said, I guess God comes to some men gradually. But his impact upon me was sudden and profound. And as sick as I was, I, I didn't realize at that moment that that was indeed a profound spiritual experience for me. 
And I have come to believe in miracles. Because miracles are real and happen to those who are unafraid to believe in them. But I stood up that morning and I did something I had promised to do when I sat on that segregated train going to Boston. That I would never put my foot in the church and I certainly didn't believe in God. I would never pray again because there was nothing to pray for because I believed in nothing and trusted no one. But I stood up and I heard myself saying, God, please, don't let me die. And I don't know where those words came from. But I picked up that phone. It was about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, and I called a friend. It was my last friend, and I'm sure that, that God loves us so much that he leaves a guardian angel for us. Because that was the one lady who had not given up on me. She didn't visit me much but she would call me from time to time. And I said to her, I think I'm going to die. And the secret was finally out that I'm going to die if I don't stop drinking. And that's a secret I tried to protect myself with from everybody else knowing that. And she's not an alcoholic, she said, but I hear there's a place that's called Alcoholics Anonymous, and they help people get sober. And they stay sober. And I've never, I'm one of the intellectual varieties of drunk. I had gone to gurus. I had read uh, East Indian philosophies. You know, I've been to therapists and psychiatrists. And I tried to find another way. I tried to find someone who would tell me what was wrong with me. And she said, they stay sober. And I don't know how they do it, but call them. And I picked up that phone at a reasonable hour that morning, and I called the central office, and the man said, good morning, this is Alcoholics Anonymous, may I help you? And I said, man, my name is Clara, and I can't stop drinking. It was just that little moment of truth that gave me a feeling of surrender, because I was really very tired. He said, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous, he said, and don't drink today, and that seemed like unbelievable statement because everybody else had told me how, you know, I could stop drinking. And he told me where to go to my first meeting that night. He gave me the directions and I hung up and what I felt was a conversation with a stranger was hope. And I had never had any hope in my life, and I feel the same hope when I read the story to Bill w, of Bill W's, that if a man could go that far in his drinking and, and end up in the, in the crucial stages of alcoholism, and he could get sober, that was hope. And so I started to get dressed that morning for my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I called my brother because I didn't have a car. I had lost all of those things. And I told him I thought I'd found a place for me. And it was called Alcoholics Anonymous, and I needed the car to go to that meeting. And I can still hear his footsteps running up the stairs. And I opened the door, and he embraced me. And he kissed me on the cheek, and he said, we love you. We love you. It pains us to see you live like this. I hope this is going to work for you. And he held me. If you take the keys and you keep the car as long as you want to use it. And that morning I started to get dressed. I didn't know about detox, and I did my detox and sitting in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous with the loving arm of the fellowship and especially the women in this program around me. But I didn't know those terms at that time. And around 10 o'clock, the kids had gone off to school, but I knew in my mind that I just could not make the run down to that liquor store. Dress of wine stains on it. <laughs> so I got the dress out, got a brush and some soap and water, cleaned up the stains and hung it back in the closet, got that wig out. Now I've been hiding under that wig for about five years. I mean, if that wig could have talked, it would have blackmailed me alone. <laughs> So I got the head palm and got the wig on there, and I clipped the bangs and sprayed it up, and it was looking good. 
around noon time or somewhere around noon time, I began to really, my body began to shake. But I was about to not have a drink for the first time in 27 years. And I didn't know what to do with myself. So I went over Woolworths and I decided to uh, get myself some eyelashes. And so I stole some eyelashes from a first meeting. <laughs> And they come quite long, and I didn't know you're supposed to trim them. <laughs> so I put them under my jacket. I beat it back to that house. It's around 2 o'clock. It was an 8 o'clock meeting. So at 7 o'clock, I'm all dressed. Got the dress on, the wig's looking good. And I'm shaking, and I'm trying to get the glue along the edge of the lash. <laughs> So I remember standing in the mirror and just bouncing and waiting for an opportune moment. And I slammed the lash in. One end was up here and the other end was down there. I leaned in the mirror and I said, you looking good. I got my brother's car and I walked, I got in the car and I drove off to that meeting. And as I got up to the walk, the man in central office didn't tell me it was a church. And I was, I wasn't prepared, prepared for what I saw when I looked at the church, but I remember the feeling of surrender. I opened my hands and I said, whatever, whatever, I'm tired. Walked in there along tall, tall Scotty, who's my friend today, put his hand out and he was a greeter. He said, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. And he said, get yourself a cup of coffee. And I walked in there trying to look cool. Because, see, I had always strolled around jazz clubs looking cool. And I walked in there and I was trying to pull it off again and I was just, body was vibrating. <laughs> And I had kind of cleaned up, you know, that, that pore, uh, the pores in my skin, that ripple was still coming through, and it didn't really smell like Chanel number no. 5, you know? <laughs> and I walked to, to the table where they had the coffee, and they had real coffee cups when I got sober. And, uh... <laughs> And as a newcomer, I got the chance to wash a lot of those cups. Thank you, God. And I put the cough in the cup, and I put in too much, and I began to shake, and I didn't want you to see me with the coffee spilling over the side, so I quietly put the cup down and went and sat in the chair. As I sat there, I reviewed my life. For those 27 years of daily drinking, it brought me to my knees in alcohol, had stripped me of all human dignity. And it had stripped me of all moral ethics of living, and I certainly learned in that wonderful family of mine who had wanted my life to be different and had wanted me to reach the high achievements that they'd all reached. But as I sat there, I felt absolutely lifeless. And when I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, I sang in the junior choir in Union Baptist Church. And what came to my mind was a, was a song that a slave had written in the fields of Georgia. And this slave knew what God was going to say to them when they got to heaven. God was going to greet them and say, sit down. I know you're tired. You rest a while. And I saw that wonderful countdown last night. And all of you new friends have come to begin this journey of sobriety. I welcome you. Hope you'll just sit down and rest a while. And let us love you until you can learn to love yourself. That's what they told me and the other newcomer friends who were in those meetings at that time. And they asked, they started the meeting, they asked for the hands of the newcomers. And I didn't know I was a newcomer. <laughs> I didn't know the language. And I have learned that the language is the language of the heart. The lady behind me touched me on my shoulder and she said, raise your hands, honey, you're a newcomer. <laughs>
and I raised my hand, and they told me, uh, I wanted what you had, tried 90 days, and if I didn't want what you had, I was welcome to go back to my misery. And I found some hope in that meeting uh, that night. The lady who touched me on my shoulders gave me her phone number. She told me to go home and call her, and she would tell me what Alcoholics Anonymous was about. And she became my sponsor that night, and she's still my sponsor today. Seventeen and a half years later, we are still on the road, you know, of loving action with one another. And she was the one who helped me through the steps, took me to meetings, and thank God for women in Alcoholics Anonymous who would pick, come to the ghetto. We are willing to go to any lens. And she would pick me up, and they would pick me up and take me to meetings, and I would bounce around because I was withdrawing in, in the meetings. And they would just love me. And this went on for a while. I was not employable. I got into the steps, and I started, I went to 12 to 14 meetings a week. And that was to, to, to be a pattern of mine for, for my first three years. It set the foundation of my program today. They told me to sit down and, and, and to listen. And I started to do the things that you told me to do. My, when I was six months sober, my sponsor told me I had to get a job. And I wasn't really still thrilled with the news. <laughs> I had a huge ego, and I didn't think working was important. And, um, and today, I, I love your theme where it says a way of living, because it was the beginning of a way of living that I had never experienced before. So I uh, got this job as a waitress, and I had, the book says, the ego must be smashed. I wasn't thrilled with picking up tips off the table. I was a terrible waitress. Uh, I dumped coffee on people, had a bad attitude. <laughs> I started to get involved in, with the lives of those children of mine. And I love the part in the big book, The Family After. It's been a long road for me with them. And it's been slow, but it's also been profound. Because I had to um, start to learn how to be a mother. How to show up when I said I was. And I, it took a while, probably my first five or six, seven years, for them to start to trust me. And it took my first five years of me trying to forgive myself. So I got involved in, the, in that job, and I learned how to have some sense of self-worth and self-esteem by learning how to show up on time at that job and give to those employers uh, a full day's work. It was part of me trying to, beginning to learn how to live by the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. And when I was two years sober, I was, wanted to go back to that business. I drank away, and I went to my home group, and I went to my sponsor, and I told them what I would like to do, and they helped me. And the guys in my, in my home group uh, went and had business cards made for me and it, to, to start out house cleaning. And on my day off from the, from the waitress job, I would go over to Beverly Hills and those big houses. And I always had problems with rejection. And I would stand at the door and ring the doorbell and, 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 and look down at the ground and hand them my business card. And, and pretty soon a lady hired me. And I went over there, boy, the typical alcoholic. I went over there and I worked and I worked. I even took Q-tips tips and cleaned out the keyholes. <laughs> Perfection. <laughs> And as a re result of my, my work, she called with other friends, and pretty soon I was, you know, I was, I was on my way, and then I was able to give up the waitress job and hire some people. And today, that's what I do in Los Angeles. I have contracts to the homes of the movie stars, the rich and the famous, and I don't steal, and I don't lie, and I don't cheat, and I don't pay the bills. I still try to practice those principles in all of my affairs to the best of my ability. Um, it got better. I started inter and interacting with those kids, and I, I remember when I was two years sober doing a major fourth step, an honest fourth step with that sponsor. I had trouble, you know, making um, uh, real, real truth for me with her. 
I didn't want people to always know the real truth because I was afraid if you knew the truth, you might not let me stay here. But I also know now that if I don't tell the truth, I'm not likely to stay here. So that fourth step was really a, a, a moving point for me to get on with my life. I started, I went through those steps as they are designed, and, and the eighth and ninth step, I started to work with the men with that family. I remember going to that, that sister who wouldn't loan me the money to save the house. You know, and, and I remember I, I remember going to them and talking to them and interacting in their lives because the eighth and ninth step for me means an ongoing demand. It doesn't mean just saying I'm sorry. Sometimes it's as simple as a little bouquet of flowers when I visit them unexpected. And it comes from that little bouquet of flowers brings my love. And that I'm, I'm interacting in their lives today, what I call in a spiritual interaction. Because I believe spirituality to me means many things. It's spiritual to forgive. It's spiritual to be forgiven. And to turn my will and my life over to the care of God in time. It takes care of the healing. That was a part of my interaction with them and it's grown. And today I am in, a, in that family in a loving way and a lot of love that exists between us in family union. One of those sisters passed away two weeks before this past Christmas. And that family's called to the hospital and we stood in that room. There's been a lot of loss in my life and a lot of grief in the last couple of years. Friends, the wonderful Alabama Carruthers who passed on recently, who would have been 39 years sober in December, who was a dear friend, it seems like the role is being called. And I stood in that room and we, my sister said, I would like for us to hold hands. And I am the one who would like to pray. I want to thank God for having been in this family all these years. And I have been given the best that life offers. And I was holding her frail little left hand with my strong right hand. And as she prayed, she looked up at me and I looked into her eyes. And I felt peace in my soul because I saw forgiveness in her eyes. And I am glad that my sponsor had told me long ago to, do the, to make those amends because they were for me. Because now was the moment. We are not promised tomorrow. We do it now. And I am glad I had taken her directions. Because as I looked at, at, at that sister, so weak, she said, you know, it's time to go. I'm tired. It's time to go. I'll miss you all. But I love you so much. A few hours later, she was gone. With all of them together, I hope that their souls are soaring to a higher place. With no more crying and there's no more dying and no more pain. And I celebrate having had the experience of each and every one of them as our lives touched each other. It's been a wonderful journey. And the longer I am sober, the narrow the road becomes but the wider the vision. For what it takes to stay here, loving action with my fellow man, Prayer and meditation and the 11th step is part of my daily being. Wherever I am, I take the moment to be grateful. I am grateful that I am sober, and I ask God to keep me humble. Humility brings to me serenity. Serenity brings peace of mind and the feeling of oneness with God. One year ago today, I was called to the hospital. I had a, a, a beautiful daughter, that younger daughter. Uh, 
I saw her go to the ice capades when I was five years sober, a professional ice skater. She's married to a wonderful young man that so is like a son to me. Uh, they're yuppies. <laughs> they live up in Santa Clarita Valley, California, successful in whatever that is, and absolutely loving and wonderful. They plan their first child. <laughs> never had such plans. <laughs> and a year ago today, they called me, and I'm a, ver I'm a very active person, and working with newcomers, and on skid row, and doing all those things, and, and I was um, called to that hospital to, to be a part of the birth of that little daughter. And I canceled my plans, and rushed them down out there, and got on that elevator, and went up to that room. And young people today have something called the mom's uh, system. <laughs> Tapes were playing and seagulls were chirping. <laughs> and I walked into that room and she was in pain and there was perspiration on her brow. And I had the opportunity to take a cloth and wipe the preparation away and to take a nice lotion and massage her hand and her legs. And I started to cry real tears. I'd sat so many years in that chair, crying silent tears over broken dreams and unresolved relationships. And as the tears ran down my face, I looked at her and they were running down her face. And she said, Mother, I'm glad you are here and I love you. And I almost missed it all. Uh, that older son has a, a son who's gone through an unpleasant divorce recently, and I have a little five and a half year old grandson. His name is Aaron. And I don't lie to Aaron, and I, when I make a promise to him, I show up. And I take him to the park. Mostly we go to Toys R Us. <laughs> And this all began, this, this spiritual journey for me started on my first 12-step call. When I was between three and four years sober, I got well. <laughs> There's something very dangerous about getting well in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'd gone back to that business, bought a nice little home that I still live in, and Bought that big car, you know, I still bought that big Eldorado, and I began to look good and start to smell, to start to smell the roses again and the aroma, and start to hear the music. And I start sliding away from meetings, and uh, one Saturday afternoon, I was playing some Billie Holiday records and dancing around my living room, planning on going out after my Saturday night meeting to the local bar just to have some seven up. I was setting it up, you know, for the big fall. And the phone rang. It seems that God gets busy getting my attention. <laughs> and it was central office calling. And a lady said, Clara, we have a 12-step a call, and we wondered if you would take it. And I got, was not thrilled. <laughs> and I said, well, where is it? She said, it's down on Skid Row. I said, oh, I don't think I'm qualified. <laughs> there are a lot of people in Alcoholics Anonymous that have far more experience in that type of 12-step call. I'm used to going to meetings in Beverly Hills. She said, she got annoyed with me. She said, oh, just stop it. Will you please take the call? <laughs> so I had always heard you never turn down an AA request. So there was something about that loving interaction with my sponsor. I thought I'd better run this by her. So I picked up the phone, and I called Carol, and I said, Carol, I just had a call from Central Office, and they want me to make a 12-step call, and I was talking real fast. And I said, you know, I don't really think that I know how to do that. And, uh, that, you know, I just said that she wasn't saying a word. 
So when I get no, got no response from her, I said, look, I don't want to do it. And she said, I don't care what you don't want to do. You do it anyway. And she hung up. So I called this little actress that I was sponsoring. She's about 90 days sober. I said, we're going on a 12-step call, because I said, you don't, go on a, you don't go on a 12-step call alone, and I need somebody to go with me. She said, where? I said, it's on Skid Row. She said, oh, I don't want to do that. I said, I don't care what you don't want to do. Here. She came over, we get in my car, we go downtown, we got the address, you know, we started to look for this hotel and it was not part of the Hilton chain, I assure you. <laughs> so there was no name outside, just the number. So we drive up, we park, you know, I had to park the car about two or three feet from the curb because there's wine bars up and down the gutter. And we walk into this hotel and it was this big lobby and they had these big transistor radios and and they were in there booging and drinking wine and beer and just having a ball in the lobby. I just couldn't find a clerk. There's a long red arrow along the wall that pointed to a bell. And, I, and it says, ring this bell for attention. I rang the bell. And this guy came out of this club like, wham. And he looked and he said, uh, can I help you? I said, yeah, do you have somebody here named Dorothy? He said, oh, yeah, she's up on the third floor. Now, we don't have any numbers in this hotel, but she's at the end of the hall. So we get in this elevator, and on the elevator floor were wine balls and beer cans and urine. It smelled like a latrine. We were holding up our pants so we won't get into all this stuff on the elevator floor. It creaked. It would stop, and then it would, by a few seconds, and then it would wobble back and forth, and we'd go up to the next step. And so we are holding each other, my baby and I, and we get up to the third floor, and we open the door, and, and these three alcoholics passed out on the, in, in, in the hall, and we step over there, and we get to the end, of, the, of that corridor, and I knock on the door, and a little voice said, come in. We walk into that room, about a six by six, beautiful blonde young woman, about 21 or two years old, was curled up in a fetal position on that floor, and she had lost all body control. Wine balls were everywhere. The scent was unbelievable. And water bugs were so huge, they crunched as we walked around the room. And it was that moment when I looked at her. I had that feeling as I looked at the roots of, this, of the disease. And it was like God using me as a messenger. So I could see exactly the depths of this disease and where it would take you in about the yes. And somehow in my heart, for the first time, I felt some feeling of compassion. Probably the same kind of compassion that the young nun felt for me as she looked at my battered face. And that little actress and I got her up, and with tender, loving care, we dressed her. All of that other stuff went out of the window, and I was holding and embracing sick alcoholic. What we learned here is one alcoholic talking to another. We braced her up, and we got her dressed, and we put her between us, and we got her on that elevator, and we got her down to that lobby, and I called central office on what to do with her. And they told us where to take her to a place uh, that's no longer there, where they would, uh, they would call ahead, and they, we, they would take her in. And we drove down there, and we registered her, and I remember they had, they put occupation on the little registration card, and she looked at me, and she was still quite drunk. And she said, well, I'm a hooker. I said, I know all about it, darling. Um, just put it on the card. And then we decided to take it to an all-night diner and give her some coffee and talk to her about Alcoholics Anonymous like I had never talked about Alcoholics Anonymous. And when you told me, take what I can use and store the rest, it came forward, we're sitting in this all-night diner. And what had started off at 2 o'clock in the afternoon was now 3 o'clock the next morning. So I am talking to her about the first step that says, we are powerless over alcohol, and our lives are unmanageable. 
She could relate to that. I talked about the second step. She said that God would restore us to sanity. She explained to me that every member of her family had died or were dying of the disease of alcoholism, a drug addiction. When we got to the third step, I said, we are willing to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God. We understand God. She said, don't you talk to me about God. She stood up, I stood up, and I guess there was still some unresolved anger. I reached across the table and grabbed her by that little pink sweater. I was going to punch her out. <laughs> so Steps said, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of Steps, said, we try to carry the message. Didn't say beat him up if they don't want it. <laughs> and I don't know where Dorothy is this Sunday morning. But as a result of that 12-step call, it changed the course of my life in, in, in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I started to learn that I could make 12-step calls, as, well, as we all can with the newcomer at the coffee pot. I put out my hands, and as a result of that 12-step call with Dorothy, and I hope she's sober, and I hope she's alive, and wherever she is, I thank her. Because God put her there for, for me to see that I had to take another road. And as a result of all of that, I today have for 14 years now gone to Skid Row as a result of being down there. I, I suit up and I show up and I go on panels and I sponsor. And I am a firm believer in sponsorship. Two weeks after I started going to see Dorothy, I walked in there about the 14th day and she had left. She would gotten well. And that's the way it is. And we keep walking the journey. When I wake up in the morning now and I see the dawn of a day, of a new day, it's not, thank you, God, sitting in the chair. It's on my knees saying, thank you, Master. Let me in some small way today be a living example of this program. Help me to be the instrument that you can channel some alcoholic who is suffering this day that you're trying to reach. And I get up and I walk out of there and I'm blessed to be alive. So I know what it is to be alive with joy. And this is a way of living for me. And before I leave, I feel the high energy and the love in this room, and I've never done this before. But would you take a moment with me of silence and pray for the alcoholic who is still suffering out here this morning? Thank you. God bless you. You render me sober. You render me sane. With the grace of God. For that I'm eternally grateful. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.